As many of you know, I've spent the last 20 years in the real estate and finance industry. But it wasn't until three years ago when I started this YouTube journey that my eyes were open to how many financial tips and tricks there really were out there. So I started a document, and as I found more and more money hacks on YouTube, I recorded each and every one of them. And just this last week, that list crossed 100 financial hacks that I've found on YouTube. And that's what I'm going to share with you in this video. Now, these are in totally random order, so you never know when you might find that one that changes your life and finances forever. Oh, and by the way, the single most important financial slash money hack that I found is the one at the very end. Oh, and for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nolan Mathias. Like I said in the beginning, I've spent 20 years in the finance and real estate industry, and I've run both seven and eight figure companies. And my mission is to inspire people to thrive and give. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into the 100 financial hacks that you can use to make yourself significantly better off. The first is the 1% 10% rule. For every 1% increase in interest rates, your cost of borrowing goes up by about 10%. So in other words, if interest rates go up 1% and you have a $100,000 loan, it's going to cost you about an extra $10,000 on that loan. Now, this rule can be used in a whole bunch of other ways as well. For example, if interest rates go up by 1%, it decreases the amount that you qualify for on a mortgage, for example, by about 10%. Next is the 50-30-20 rule. And this one helps you determine how much money you should be putting where after you pay your taxes. So every month when you get your paycheck, 50% should be going towards your necessities, 30% should be going towards your wants, and 20% should be going towards your savings. Next is to take advantage of free financial consultations. Every single bank out there wants your business, and one of the best things you can do is allow them to try to earn it. The way that you do this is by presenting your current financial situation to them and having them make recommendations. Now, there's two reasons for this. First is you might actually find somebody who can help manage your finances better than it's being done right now, but the other is to educate yourself on what you could potentially be doing better with your finances. Giving banks the opportunity to earn your business by having them tell you what they would do will absolutely 100% educate you on what you could be doing better with your money. Okay, this one's one of my favorites. This is the 15 minute daily financial read. So here's what you do. You spend 15 minutes a day educating yourself on finances. After 30 days of immersing yourself in just 15 minutes of financial education a day, you will have spent the equivalent of seven and a half hours over the month. After a year, you'll have over 90 hours worth of financial education, which if you think about it, should very much put you on the path to financial freedom. Next is rounding up your change. So let's say you buy a cup of coffee every single day and the amount is, I don't know, $1.25 or $3.25 or $5.25, whatever that amount is for you, whatever type of coffee you like, whether you're a Dunkin' person or a Starbucks person, let's just say you round up the change to the next dollar. So in this case, you would have 75 cents every single time you buy a cup of coffee that you could put into savings. If you were to start doing this at the age of 23, by the time you turn 65, you would have, get this, over $23,000 in additional savings. Next is a tip from Warren Buffett, or more precisely, it's a set of rules. Rule number one when it comes to investing is don't lose money. And rule number two is never forget rule number one. Now, why is this so important? Because when it comes to investing, what this does is it causes you to invest only in things that you know are tried and true. So rather than putting all your money on Tesla and hoping that it continues to go to the moon, you invest in other companies that have significantly better track records over a longer period of time. So you avoid the 65% decline that by the way, Tesla had in the last year. Automate and forget. That's right, set up an automatic withdrawal every single month that goes from your bank account to your savings. By doing this and forgetting that it's even there, you're basically setting up another bill payment. So as a result, you get the money out of your bank account and it's a lot less likely that you'll spend it. Oh, and by the way, doing this only takes like five minutes to set up. Okay, so if you haven't started investing and you don't know where to start, start with index funds. This is a super simple way to dip your toes into investing and building a portfolio. And by choosing index funds that put baskets of goods together in different sectors, you're essentially eliminating a lot of your risk, or at least reducing it quite a bit. And once you've gotten good at building a balanced index portfolio, then you can start looking at doing other investing if you want to. But you probably don't need to. You could probably just stick to index investing for the rest of your life, like Ray Dalio and Warren Buffett recommend, and do very, very well without ever having to pick individual stocks and taking a flyer on something like Tesla that loses 65% of its value in a year. Oh, and speaking of Ray Dalio, check out his all-weather portfolio. This is a portfolio that is designed to do well in every single type of economy. And Dalio suggests that in order to build this portfolio, you put 40% into long-term bonds, 15% into short-term bonds, 30% into the S&P 500, 
and then 7.5% into gold and commodities. And while this portfolio doesn't necessarily get the returns that simply investing in the S&P 500 might, it does reduce and limit your potential losses. Okay, so now it's time to talk about debt paydown. And there's two primary strategies for this. The first is the one made famous by Dave Ramsey, and that is the debt snowball. This is where you pick your smallest debt, you pay it off, and then you take the amount of money that you were making in payments on the small debt and move it to your next smallest one. And then once you've paid off the next smallest one, you move it to the next smallest one until all your debt is completely paid off. Now, the reason why this works so well, at least according to Ramsey, is because of the psychological effect of having those early wins. But that being said, it may not be the most efficient way of paying off your debt and getting out of debt fast. No, that title goes to the debt avalanche method. This is where you pay off your highest interest rate debt first, regardless of the size of the accounts, and you continue to pay off debt until you get to the lowest interest rate debt. Now, the downfall here is if you're starting with big debts that have high interest rates, you may not get that dopamine hit of paying off that debt right away. So without those small wins, the theory is you may fail. But this comes down to how dedicated you are and ultimately the choices that you make. So choose the one that works the best for you. Now, in addition to the debt snowball and the debt avalanche, the other thing that you can do is take advantage of 0% transfer offers. So this is where a credit card, a company offers to transfer your debt from another provider to them in exchange for a 0% interest rate for a certain period of time. Now, keep in mind, there's often transfer fees associated with this, so you have to watch that. And you probably don't want to take advantage of this hack more than once or twice a year, because it could do undue damage to your credit as you apply for more and more credit cards. Next, let's talk about one of the most popular ways to budget your money, and that is the envelope system, or the jar system, or whatever system you want to call it. But basically what this is, is it takes multiple envelopes, multiple jars, and you separate your money every single time you get a paycheck, into the different categories. So maybe you have house payments, maybe you have electricity bills, maybe you have things that you want and things that you need and a food budget, and those all have separate envelopes. You then go about using the money for the budgeted items as you see fit, but the best part of this is it's visual. So if you start to get low in one area, you start to realize that maybe you have to pull from other areas or you may run out of money by the end of the month. It's a really great tool for budgeting if you're not the type of person who is in love with spreadsheets. Next, let's talk about buying decisions, the 30-day rule. Anytime you wanna buy something that you don't absolutely need, put it on a list and wait 30 days before you actually make the purchase. What you will find is quite often something that you really want in the moment, 30 days from now, is something that you don't necessarily desire anymore. Oh, and anytime that you find yourself in a high pressure environment where you need to buy something, but the salespeople are putting pressure on you to buy right now, use the 24 hour rule. This is the rule where you always sleep on every major purchase, especially in times where you're being pressured to buy now. Now, the big benefit to this is if you say to a salesperson, I don't buy anything without sleeping on it, and they don't respect that rule, that decision that you have made for your buying process, there's a really good chance that you'll find other unfair and unhonest practices in their business practices down the road, so you may be avoiding a major hassle later on. Next, let's talk about maxing out rewards. Credit card rewards can be something that are hugely valuable as long as you are cautious with them. They can also be something that costs you a significant amount of money because you are incentivized to spend more. And spending more to get rewards points is essentially spending dollars to chase pennies. Yes, the rewards that you get are pennies compared to what you actually have to spend. But if you are smart about it and you pay off your debts every single month, then using a credit card that has a reward system can be hugely beneficial, especially if you're somebody who likes to travel or if you like collecting cash back. So let's talk about meal prepping for a second here. Meal prepping can be something that can shed some pounds. It can also be something that saves you a bunch of money. Yes, meal prepping is the thing that will prevent you from hitting the skip the dishes or the Uber Eats button on your cell phone when you don't have the desire or the energy to prepare food yourself. So putting together weekly meals and then throwing a couple in the freezer for down the road when the moments where you don't feel like cooking arise can actually save you thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars over your lifetime. Subscription audits. Every six months, do a subscription audit, if not every three months. Go through your credit card bills and check to make sure that you're still using all the subscriptions that you've signed up for. Maybe you ordered Netflix for a single show or Paramount or Disney Plus and you aren't watching any shows on there right now. Well, cancel them and then fire them back up when the next season comes out. Do a savings challenge. So there's all kinds of savings challenges out there. Just look them up online. 
One of my favorites is to save a dollar on the first day, then $2 on the second, $3 on the third, and to do that for an entire month. Believe it or not, by the end of 30 days, you'll have $500 saved. Okay, so let's talk skill monetization. A lot of us have skills that are totally saleable. We just have to know where to sell them. And there are all kinds of freelance and handyman platforms out there that you can use in order to sell your services. If you're good at graphic design, or maybe good at writing, or you're good at fixing things, put your services out there for other people to purchase, and you can make a pretty good amount of extra coin on the side just by doing some extra things that you already know how to do, and more than likely probably love to do as well. Declutter for profit. This is a really cool one. Most of us have so much stuff in our house that we no longer value, but other people will buy in order to get a really good deal. Have a treadmill in your basement you haven't used in years, somebody's willing to buy it. Have a Bowflex from Costco that you bought in 1995, if you know you know. Put it on Facebook Marketplace and get rid of it. There's somebody out there willing to spend money on the stuff that you think is junk. If you can't buy it twice, you can't afford it. That's a saying my grandfather used to say to me and one that I'm passing down to my children. For every non-essential item that we buy, we need to put away the equivalent amount of money into our savings. So if I wanna buy a PS5 for my kid that costs $500, I need to put $500 into savings as well. By doing so, you will always make sure that your financial priorities are taken care of even though you're spending a little bit of money on yourself in that moment. Let's talk about using visual debt and savings trackers. So these are things like charts and apps that visually track your goals. Remember back in elementary school when they had the thermometer on the wall that showed how much money had been raised for that school trip? Yeah, that's the same idea. And it doesn't matter what you use to track this visually, it can literally be a thermometer on the wall that you color in as you save more money or pay off debt, or it can be an app on your phone. But what matters is that you look at it visually and you check in on a regular basis. Actually scratch that, make sure you check in on it daily. Now, if you don't think that you can get out of debt or you don't think you can hit a savings goal, you need to change your money mindset. That's right, we're going back to the chalkboard and we're writing lines. One of the fastest ways I've found to reprogram my brain to convince myself that I can reach astronomical financial goals is by writing lines. Things like, I enjoy earning $500,000 a year, or writing things like, I enjoy being free and clear from debt by the end of the year. Now at first, every single time you write a line, your subconscious may be saying, you can't do that stupid. But over time, over 30 days, after writing these lines every single day, you will find that your subconscious starts to look for solutions to the problem you have presented. So if you're trying to pay off $100,000 of debt in the next three months and you don't think you can do it, start writing those lines and your mind will start looking for ways to make it happen. Next, invest in a great coffee machine. So many of us spend five, six, seven dollars a day or up to $20 a day on our Starbucks habit and it just isn't necessary. You can make way better coffee at home for way cheaper. In fact, I did the math on this. We pay about 59 cents per day for our daily coffee habit. And the reason why we can do this is because 10 years ago, we spent a ton of money on an espresso machine. And when I go back and do the math, we now save about $1,800 per year on buying coffee at local coffee shops. So for the last 10 years, that means we've saved approximately $18,000. The 365 day pennies in a jar challenge. This is where on day one, you put a penny into the jar. And on day two, you put two pennies into a jar. And every day of the year for an entire year, you put the equivalent number of pennies into the jar for the day of the year that you are on. So on day 250, you're putting $2.50 in the jar. On day 365, you're putting $3.65 in the jar. By the end of the year, you'll have $667 in the jar which makes for a pretty good holiday budget. Free fitness. Instead of expensive classes, try getting out for a walk or a run. Maybe start hiking or take that bike, not the electric one you bought from Costco, and take it for a ride. We all know what we need to do to get fit or get into better shape. It's time you just go out and do it. Oh, and speaking of getting fit and gym memberships, you probably don't need one of those either. There are a ton of amazing videos on YouTube that will show you exactly how to build an amazing physique, often without even having any equipment. Speaking of getting things for free, did you know that pretty much every single book out there can be borrowed from a library? And most libraries now have digital libraries. So instead of going out and shelling out 20 or 30 bucks for that new book, why don't you check it out at your library first to see if you actually like it. One of my biggest pet peeves is you pretty much have to get a subscription for every type of software that you use now. Search for free alternatives online first. Get a free education. YouTube is an amazing place to get an education on pretty much anything that you want and ultimately get the skills you need in order to get a raise and make more money. Oh, and if you want a really good resource, not just for you, 
but also for your kids, make sure you check out Khan Academy. That's K-H-A-N. Travel in off-peak or shoulder seasons. One of the biggest ways you can save money is by not traveling when everyone else is traveling. Oh, and by the way, there's a really great added side benefit to this. No lines, less crowds, and the ability to do a lot more of what you want to do in a lot shorter period of time. If you want to figure out when the shoulder seasons are and when the best times to travel to any destination are, make sure you check out Google Flight Aware. Speaking of travel, loyalty pays. Make sure you pick an airline and a hotel brand that you are loyal to. Take advantage of their points programs and you'll find in no time you will be flying first class and getting hotel upgrades just because you consistently stay at one place. Oh, and secret travel tip here, use your stays at the cheap hotels to earn vacation travel at the expense of ones. When you do travel, take public transport over private taxis. There's a whole bunch of reasons for this, but my favorite one is that you get to talk to people. Find out from the locals where the best places to go are, and maybe even make some new friends along the way. Oh, and if you're brand new to a major city, check out the guided bus tours. I always go on one of these the first day I arrive in a new city in order to learn the lay of the land. Bulk buy essentials that are on sale. Want to have that extra money for travel? Well, anytime you see something that you know you are going to use over the long term, make sure you buy it when it's on sale. There's two reasons for this. One, you're getting a huge discount, but two, you're buying at today's prices, not tomorrow's prices. It's the best hedge against inflation that you can make. Think things like toilet paper, canned foods, or anything else you can buy that you know you will absolutely use that won't expire. Eat in season. Anytime you go to the grocery store, there are going to be goods that are in season and out of season. The ones that are in season tend to be a lot cheaper. The ones that are out of season tend to be a lot more expensive. Next, try meatless days. Implement a meatless Monday and it'll save you about $23 a week. That's almost $1,200 per year. Want to take it one step further? Double down and try two meatless days per week. That's almost $2,400 worth of savings per year for a family. Unplug and save. Did you know that up to 10% of your electricity bill is from things that are turned off but are plugged in? That's right, this is called phantom power. And what it means is even if you aren't using something like your phone charger, if it's plugged in, it's using energy. So unplug everything when you're done using it and save a ton. Negotiate everything. Periodically call your service providers, your cable, your electricity, your internet, whatever other service providers you have, and see if you can get a better rate. But before you do this, make sure you check out the competitors to see what they're offering new clients. Bring up the lower rate that you can get elsewhere, and there's a high likelihood that your current service provider will provide you a pretty steep discount to remain a client. Periodically negotiate a raise. Every few months, ask your employer, does the quality of the work that I'm doing warrant a raise? If it does, awesome, you might get one. If it doesn't, ask what they would like to see in order for you to get a raise. Then go about implementing that, wait a few months, and ask for it again. And don't forget, you don't get what you don't ask for. Periodically test the job market to see if you can get a better job at better pay. This is beneficial in multiple ways. It allows you to continually perfect your resume and also it allows you to practice doing job interviews. So when you get an opportunity for a job that you really do want, you'll be ready to play. Oh, and it totally allows you to determine what your market value is on the open market, meaning you'll know exactly what you're worth and what your employer should be paying you. This one's an easy one. Every single time a light bulb burns out, replace it with an LED. They last longer, they're more energy efficient, and they will save you a ton on your electricity bill. Buy generic over brand names. My wife and I couldn't believe it last week when the meat manager at our local grocery store suggested that we buy the generic brand. He even hinted that it was actually made by the more expensive brand. It turns out the bacon was the same. In fact, it was some of the best bacon we've ever tried. So anytime you have the opportunity to buy generic, keep in mind, it's probably on par with the quality of the brand name stuff. But that doesn't always mean you should buy generic. For things that you use every single day, buy quality. For example, spending $500 on a high quality pair of shoes that you know you will wear often is a significantly better option than buying cheap ones. Think about it, if a $500 pair of shoes with a little bit of maintenance lasts you 10 years, that's $50 per year. Think about the cheap shoes you've bought in the past and how they typically fall apart after a year and you're actually saving money by buying the high-end goods. Instead of digging into TV shows and movies, Try YouTube learning instead. Watch an educational video that's both entertaining and can teach you how to make more money. If you spend an hour a day watching educational videos rather than entertainment shows on Netflix or wherever you watch them, at the end of the year, that'll be 365 hours worth of education. And you might come out of it with something like this, a list of 100 money hacks that can help you save money, make money, and get richer. Try a skill exchange. So this is where you exchange a skill that you have for a skill that somebody else has. So for example, if you are a carpenter or a woodworker and somebody needs some work done to their house, you trade that maybe for something like accounting services. 
This is the most basic level of bartering and it is a way to save yourself a ton of money. On that same vein, try a date night exchange. Reach out to other couples, know this isn't where that's going, and ask them if they would take care of your child in exchange for you taking care of theirs on alternating nights so that you can both go on a date night. This is an easy way to save a significant amount of money on babysitters. Do-it-yourself home fixes. Use YouTube as a tool to find out how to fix things in your home. I just did this yesterday. Our furnace broke down. I watched a YouTube video, found out exactly what needed to be replaced, went to the hardware store, got the part for about $100, and saved myself the cost of bringing out a heating person that would have cost me probably three or $400. Refinance when possible. If you have loans, if you have a mortgage, constantly be on the lookout for a better deal or a lower interest rate. Now, this isn't always going to be something that you will be able to find, but when you can, it is the fastest way to save a significant amount of money. It takes a little bit of work, but it is with certainty a way to save quickly. And don't sleep on this one either. You'd be surprised how many people spend an extra five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars over three or four years because they aren't paying attention to mortgage rates or what's going on in the interest rate world. Don't be one of those people. Instead of store-bought gifts, Give out handmade gifts or experiences. Let's say you have a friend who's having a birthday party and you share a common interest. Well, maybe gift an experience around that interest. Maybe if your buddy likes to golf and you like to golf, you can head out to a local resort course and play around. This way, you get to deepen the relationship. This is a way better gift than a dozen golf balls or a pitching wedge. Regularly explore thrift stores. You will often find brand new clothing that has barely been worn, for a third or a quarter of the price that it would be normally. Now, yes, somebody might have worn it before, but do you really care? Keep an on sale list. So this is a list for things that you know you're going to need to buy in the future. Maybe you know that you need a new winter coat or a new pair of shoes or sandals, but you won't need it until next season. Well, write it down on a list, and if you see an off-season sale for those goods, buy it at that time. It will be significantly cheaper and something that you can put away in the closet until such time that you need it. Homemade pet food. If you're somebody who likes to cook anyways, cooking up your pet's meals on a weekly basis can save you a ton of dough. All you need to do is a little bit of research. Hey, maybe check out YouTube for that. Find out exactly what your dog needs to eat and then make it at home. Instead of spending a bunch of money on concerts and shows, check out free local events. A lot of times you will find amazing artists that are willing to work just for tips. And who knows, you might find the next John Legend or Taylor Swift at your local coffee shop. Always shop your high interest savings account. If you're the type of person who puts money into high interest savings accounts, make sure you're continually on the lookout for other accounts with competitors that have better interest rates. And when you find one, move your savings from the old one to the new one and reap a little bit of extra money every single month. Avoid ATM fees. A lot of people don't realize if you use your own bank's ATM, the transaction's free. But if you find yourself at an event venue or a restaurant and you're going to the ATM, you're probably not just going to be charged a fee from your bank, but also a fee from the ATM provider. Sometimes these can be four or five dollars. So make sure if you know you're going somewhere where you might need cash, stop at your local bank on the way rather than spending money on those ATM fees. Oh, and an added tip here, I always keep a couple hundred bucks in my wallet just in case. Just make sure that you don't spend it just because you have it. Credit card perks. A lot of people don't realize that credit cards come with perks. Things like Uber credits or fitness credits or travel credits. All you have to do is check what your card provides and then make sure it gets activated. Get educated on tax deductions. This is one of the places where people can easily save money, but they avoid it because taxes are complicated and nobody wants to pay attention. But if you can get a check back every single year from the government just for knowing a few ins and outs of the tax code, well, it makes a ton of sense. And you don't have to dig deep into this, just check out some YouTube videos on how to save money on your taxes. Now, that being said, when you get that tax windfall from the refund, don't go blow it. In fact, anytime you get a windfall, don't go blow it. Take it and put it into savings. Just because you got a few extra bonus bucks doesn't mean that is permission to go and spend it. Get that money, maybe take a little bit and spend it on something that you want, but make sure that the majority goes into savings. Don't be like these people who win the lotto and end up broke three to five years down the road because they didn't put any of it away. Sell before you upgrade. So anytime you need to upgrade something, make sure you sell the thing that you're upgrading first. This gives you both the cash necessary to buy the new thing, but it also makes sure that junk doesn't end up hanging around in your house. Because we all know that as soon as we get that new camera or that new computer or that new saw or whatever it is for you, the desire to go out and sell the old object goes down because we're too busy playing with the new one. Man, there's some things I've said in this video that sound a little bit dirty. Buy refurbished over new. Especially when you're looking at electronics, always look for refurbished goods before you buy brand new. 
In fact, a lot of people don't realize this, but companies like Apple have entire sections of their websites dedicated to refurbished goods. And these are typically goods that just got bought and returned without being used. So you can get a pretty significant discount, but you have to do the research to find the hidden spots on the pages to get the deals. Yes, Apple hides that page, even though it's readily available to the public. You just have to know where to find it. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some math hacks here. The rule of 70. The rule of 70 is how you determine how long it will take for your money to be worth half. So in other words, if you wanna know how long it's gonna take inflation to whittle down your money to half its value, well, just take the inflation rate, divide it into 70, and that'll give you the amount of time. So if you have 5% inflation, you divide it into 70, and it'll take 14 years for your money to lose half its value. Now, if you wanna know how long it's gonna take for your money to double, use the rule of 72. Divide the expected rate of return into 72, and that's how many years it'll take for your money to double. So if you're expecting a 7% rate of return, divide that into 72, and it will take seven point something years in order for it to double. Now, if you wanna know how long it's gonna take for your money to triple, divide it into 114. Oh, and if you wanna know how long it'll take for your money to quadruple, divide your expected rate of return into 144. Now, let's say you're trying to build a balanced portfolio. The rule of 100 determines how much you should have in stocks and how much you should have in bonds. Subtract your age from 100, and that tells you how much money you should have invested in stocks versus bonds. So if you're 40 years old, you should have 60% invested in stocks and 40% invested in bonds. Now, the reason why this works is because as you get older, it puts more of your investments into bonds than it does into stocks, creating more safety and less likelihood of losing a bunch of money. So if you're 80, for example, you'll only have 20% of your investments in stocks and 80% in bonds, making it a far less risky portfolio than your 40-year-old counterpart. Now, this rule has been updated to the rule of 110. This is for those who wanna have a little bit more risky portfolio. It works exactly the same, but for a 40-year-old, you'd have 70% of your investment in stocks rather than 60. Again, just a little bit higher risk and potentially a little bit higher return. The 2836 rule for debt. If you wanna know how much home you can afford, no more than 28% of your income should go towards your total housing costs. And no more than 36% of your income should go towards your total debt. So that includes your credit card debt, your total housing costs, and everything that you've essentially got an obligation to pay for on a monthly basis. Now, if you wanna go a little bit more conservative and make sure that you aren't house poor, use the 25-30 rule. So this is where 25% of your income goes towards housing and no more than 30% goes towards total debt, including housing. The 3-6 emergency fund rule. So if you're a dual income household, make sure that you have at least three months worth of emergency fund available to you. If you're a single income household, make sure you have at least six months of emergency income available to you. Why the difference? Well, if you're dual income and one of you loses your job, the other one will still at least have some income. But if you're a single income household, having savings equivalent to at least six months worth of expenses is crucial. Regularly review your income and expenses. If you are consistently spending more than you earn, make sure that you stop spending. You need to make adjustments. It is unsustainable. If you can't take a dime out of a dollar today, you won't be able to take a dollar out of a hundred later. So you need to make the adjustments as soon as possible. Just do it. Oh, and the way you do that is by doing a financial reset once a year. This is where you take your credit card and your bank statements from the previous month. You write down everything that you spent and you try to spend less for the coming month. And then the next month, you do it all over again. By doing this for one or two months, you should be able to reset how much you are spending. And if you aren't the type of person who wants to budget, this is the easiest way to make sure that you're paying attention to how much you spend on a pretty regular basis. If you track nothing else, track your net worth. This is a lesson that I actually learned from a mentor, not so much from YouTube, but I've seen it come up countless times on YouTube. And for those people who just don't wanna track everything, if they track just one thing, which is whether or not their net worth is growing on a monthly basis, that will give them the tools they need to make sure that they are putting money aside and spending less than they earn. If you're not growing, it's time to make adjustments. The 20, four, 10 rule for buying a car. Put 20% down when you buy a car, finance it over four years, and make sure that no more than 10% of your income is going to the cost of financing, the insurance, fuel, and everything else associated with maintaining that vehicle. The rule of 25 for retirement. Multiply your desired annual retirement income by 25, and that gives you how much money you need to save by the time you retire. So if you wanna have a $40,000 annual income at retirement, you need to save a million dollars prior to retiring. Okay, this one's interesting, the 4% rule. Essentially, the 4% rule tells you that that is the safe amount to take out of your retirement savings every single year and not run out of money. Now, on this schedule, it would allow you to maintain your retirement funds for 30 years before you ran out of money. Factor four, 
Okay, so let's say you want to determine how much mortgage you qualify for really quickly. Well, multiply your income by four, and that's about how much you'll qualify for. Then add on whatever you have saved for the down payment, and that's about your maximum purchase price. But don't go out and buy a house until you have a pre-approval or you've talked to a lender first. This is a rule of thumb, not permission to go out and waste a realtor's time. Now, that being said, the home affordability rule states that your home should be no more than 2.5 to four times your income. Obviously, the lower the total purchase price, the better because that means you'll be able to pay off the mortgage faster and not be house poor. The 20% down payment rule. This is the amount of down payment that you would need in order to avoid mortgage insurance. Doesn't matter if you're in Canada or the US, 20% is the number. The 10% savings rule. So right out of university, right out of high school, you should be saving 10% of your income. Now, if you're older and you haven't saved, you need to adjust this number up. But if you save 10% of your income from day one, right out of high school, you should have more than enough money to retire at 65. Want to know how much money you're going to need when you retire? Well, the 2x by 35 rule states that you should have two times your income saved by the time you turn 35. The 3x by 40 rule states that you should have three times your income saved by the time you're 40. The 6x by 50 rule states that you should have six times your income saved by the time you're 50. And the 8x by 60 rule states that you should have eight times your income saved by the time you're 60. Want to know how much money you should have saved for your child for college? Multiply your child's age by $2,000. That's how much money you should have put away. Now, this is for basic in-state university or college. If they want to go out of state or somewhere a little bit nicer, it's going to cost a little bit more. The 50, 5, 30 rule for small businesses. This is a general guideline for business owners. 50% of your profits should be invested back into the business. 5% should be saved for taxes and 30% should be taken off the top for profits. Oh, and by the way, if you're smart, you take that 30% off first and then whatever money is left over is what you have to spend for everything else. The rule of 78, this one's more of a warning. So the rule of 78 is a tool that's used by payday lenders in order to front load the amount of interest that you pay to the beginning of your loan. The name comes from the sum of the digits of the month. So if you have a 12 month loan, add up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you get 78. Then what they will do is charge you 12 78s of the interest on the first month, 11 78ths of the interest on the second month, all the way down to 1 78th on the 12th month. And what this does is it makes it so that the interest that you pay up front is higher just in case you pay off the loan early. So if somebody suggests that this is how they're going to calculate your interest payments, run. The 70% rule in real estate investing. This is a rule for flipping houses. When flipping a house, your purchase price should be no more than 70% of the after repaired value minus the actual cost to repair the property. The 15 times gross rent rule. This is used to determine the value of a rental property. It should be no more than 15 times the annual gross rents. Another rental property rule of thumb here, the 1% rule of thumb for rental properties. When looking at rental properties to buy, the monthly rent should be at least 1% of the total cost of the property. Now, this is a little bit more conservative than the 15X rule, but you need to decide for yourself the amount of risk that you're willing to take. The five-year rule for buying a home. If you think that you're going to move within five years of buying a home, it's probably better to rent. Now, personally, I don't think I agree with this. I think the better number is about three years, but regardless, this rule is designed to prevent you from having to pay real estate commissions, but also to make sure that you give yourself a long enough time horizon that if the market's dipped, it's had some time to come back, so you aren't selling the property for less than what you bought it for. The seven-year car ownership rule. So this is designed to minimize the amount of depreciation that you have on a vehicle. The general rule is when you buy a vehicle, own it for seven years to spread out the depreciation. Oh, and if you want to take this one step further, buy a vehicle that's one or two years old and then hold it for seven years. The price to rent ratio. This is a ratio that's designed to make it easier to determine whether or not you should be buying or renting. Take the price of a property and divide it by the annual cost to rent a similar property. If the ratio is greater than 20, it probably makes sense to rent. If the ratio is less than 20, it's probably a good buy. Go ahead, purchase the property. The 10-5-3 rule. You should expect 10% of your returns to come from stocks, 5% of your returns to come from bonds, and 3% to come from savings. The net worth rule. Want to know if you're wealthy? Multiply your age with your gross income and divide it by 10. If the amount of money that you have saved or your net worth is higher than that number, then you can consider yourself wealthy. Congratulations. The 5, 10, 17 rule for insurance. Depending on where you go, who you talk to, they all have a different number for how much insurance you should have. 
but in general, they'll come up with either 5, 10, or 17 times your annual income. Obviously, the more insurance you have, the more conservative, and the less, the less conservative. A better way to determine how much insurance you should have is the DIME method. DIME stands for Debt Income Mortgage Education. Basically, you add up the amount of debt that you have, the amount of years of income that you would want to provide for others, the amount of your mortgage, and your children's expected education costs. So go back to that 2,000 times age rule, and that is the amount of insurance that you should have available. Now, this rule completely ignores other financial resources that you may have, so you have to think about whether your partner might have an income, how much money you have available to you, and a bunch of other stuff, but it gives a pretty good starting point. The biggest return on your investment is actually the money you save because the money you save is after-tax dollars, which means if you save 20 to 30% on toilet paper, that's a significantly better return than you'll ever get in the stock market. That goes back to that buying in bulk idea, which comes from Andrew Tobias's The Only Investment Guide You Will Ever Need. It is so simple. Saving money is significantly more efficient than trying to earn it. And the last, and this is by far the most important lesson of all the lessons I've found on YouTube, and that is to create a solid financial foundation before you do anything else. Pay off high interest debt, create an emergency fund, get properly insured, and make sure that you have everything you need in the event of a potential disaster. This will relieve 99% of your financial stress and will make life and growing your wealth significantly easier. And that's it. That is the 100 financial hacks that I've learned from YouTube. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see another great video on the optimal order to invest your money, make sure you check out this one right here.